My name is Jordan. I'm a software engineer at Meta, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, VPF Trace today. Uh, mainly what it is, I'll probably not spend too much time on what's new, uh, but I definitely want to focus on what's next for VPF Trace. Uh, so what is it? Um, BPF Trace is primarily a CLI tool that uh, takes a program as an input. You can also write the programs yourself. And it runs Linux eBPF programs. And uh, it basically allows for a very fast live tracing of the Linux kernel and user space. And uh, the language BPF script is like loosely inspired by awk, C, and Dtrace. These are sort of the things that came out of familiar with BPF, it's a sort of raw way to do things, more or less, uh, where you're writing the um, BPFC code yourself, you're writing all the user space code to communicate with BPFC, uh, and you're basically doing all that setup yourself and you're using libbpf to compile it. So the program um, I'm going to walk through is called execsnoop. Uh, and all this does is it traces new processes via the exec syscall, and it just prints them out. So we have a little like, column header there, and it you know, shows the time that it happens, it shows the new process ID, it shows the parent process ID that spawned it, and then the first argument. So here it is in the BPF. And don't worry too much about like trying to read this very small code, it's more just to give an example of how much code there is to write in the BPF. So, First thing you have to do is define a, a header file for your actual event that you're going to be outputting to user space. So here we have, it you know, looks similar to those columns that we were just looking at. Um, and then we have our BPFC code. Um, and you can see there's already a lot here. We have to like define this ring buffer, which is this communication mechanism between kernel and user space. We have to set up a function to handle the events uh, that we're attaching to. And then here's all the different um, functions that basically call handle event that we're attaching to. We're attaching to these different uh, kernel trace points uh, here. And then uh, this is the user space part of the libupf code. So again, we need a function to handle the uh, events that we're passing through the ring buffer. We have a lot of boilerplate where you have to like open the program, load the program, attach. Uh, you know, to these trace points, we have to create the ring buffer. And then, you know, we have to pull this ring buffer. So as, you know, the, uh, after we attach to this event and it's, you know, creating things in our BPFC code, it's pushing these events up to uh, user space through this ring buffer, which we then have to pull. And then at the end of this, we have to clean up some resources. Uh, the same program in BCC, which is another way to write BPF, which is similar and still a lot of, you know, mostly raw BPF code, is 363 lines. And if we were going to look at the same program in BPF trace, that's it. This is all you have to write to get the exact same code running. Well, mostly. <laughs> um, but here, you know, you can see that the, here's the trace points that we're attaching to. It has like functionality where you can glob different ones which call the same uh, code. And all it does is it's just like printing, you know, the parent process, you know, the PID, the time, you know, the first argument. Like it's, it's really simplified. Uh, as I like to say, BPF trace is the JavaScript of BPF. Um, and I mean that as a compliment. Uh, <laughs> some people might yeah. think that as a negative. But I mean that you can really get working with BPF much faster with BPF trace. You don't need to know a lot of like strange BPF internals and a lot of the little complexities that go into writing that longer program I displayed. You can really just do like one liners and that's really the magic behind BPF trace is like how fast you can start tracing and observing your system uh, without having to have all this like, you know, internal knowledge about BPF. Um, BPF trace does have its limitations though, I'm just trying to be honest and fair to the libbpf and BCC. Uh, like we don't have string concatenation yet, we can't even call into these things called kfunks. Uh, we have limited BPF map support, there's no custom data types. And honestly it's not nearly as expressive as like writing your own BPFC code, obviously. Um, but we're getting there. 
Uh, we're adding a lot of new features. We're trying to make the base language, um, you know, create some really strong building blocks for it so that you can write much more expressive BPF trace programs uh, with still the ability to do these like nifty one-liners to get uh, really fast observability. So what do you use BPF trace for? Uh, let's talk a little bit about how Meta uses BPF trace. Um, just as I described, for people or engineers who are not as familiar with the complexities of BPF, they can really easily spin up BPF trace programs. And we have mechanisms, uh, we have like an orchestrator at Meta that takes these BPF trace programs and deploys them, uh, sometimes to the entire Meta fleet to run uh, and collect data. And ultimately, that data ends up in like a SQL-style database, and pe people can look at this aggregated data, um, you know, over, you know, weeks and, and days or whatnot, depending on what they're looking for. So, some concrete examples is that of that is uh, people were looking for the long tail for page fault latencies. Um, again, you know, we're talking about software page faults before, um, and by looking at this across the entire fleet and, and narrowing in on different like microservices, um, they were able to find uh, an issue that resulted in like this direct reclaim of one to two orders of magnitude, uh, which was really cool. Um, people were also starting to trace like epoll weight in the system to reveal slow code paths and I/O callbacks. And then um, I saw somebody recently putting up a script to monitor DL open to find out exactly what shared libraries are used at runtime, which is really cool. Um, so what's new? Uh, since, how many of you have heard of BPF trace before? And that's okay. Okay, all right, so, great. So I'll talk a little bit more about what's new that I play. Um, so the ability to loop over elements of your BPF map, we didn't have this before, this was new, it was a little complicated, but uh, now it's in. And so, you know, if you have a map, we have 10 and 11 is your key and 20 is your value, you can actually let loop over and get these tuples uh, that you can access and print out. Um, this is really neat. Uh, so, because BPF trace does all these steps to take a string and turn it into like some BPF bytecode, uh, we thought, wouldn't it be great if you could just skip all those steps and generate a binary um, that you can sort of pass around and use without having to share the script, essentially. So we have now ahead of time compilation. Uh, it's still being worked on, so it's more like a uh, you know an MVP work in progress at this point. Uh, but basically, you can take your BPF trace program and tell it to do AOT, and then you can just invoke it, uh, and it'll work like like a BPF trace, except with a much faster initialization time because we don't have to do all those like parsing and LLVM generation stuff. We also added a config block syntax. So there's a lot of config variables you can pass to your BPF trace program. Uh, they used to be environment variables, um, and you could still use them. Uh, but now you can actually define these configs at the top of your BPF trace file, uh, and they apply to the entire program. And this really improves sort of portability of BPF trace scripts um, if you're sharing them. So what's next for BPF trace? We have a lot of large ambitions for what we want to do with BPF trace. So the big one that we've heard from a lot of customers is the ability to interop with uh, just raw BPFC programs. So if you write some complex BPFC program that's like a library or just like you know, a function that you want to use, we want BPF trace programs to be able to use those too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's currently a work in progress um, and we really hope that you can just like write some include. Um, you know, let me just go over it. I forgot I had another slide on that specifically. So, yeah. Let's say you had Python Stack Walker wanted to walk the Python stack uh, in user space. So if you were to write a BPFC program for that, you know, you have some amount of logic that you can't write in BPF trace so that BPF trace just doesn't have the ability to. Um, you would just write it out in BPFC. 
and then you just include it in your BPF trace program and um, just call it directly. This is the API that we eventually want to get to with uh, interop with uh, BPFC programs. Uh, we also want to be able to embed BPF trace in with your binary. So right now you can pretty much just run scripts or run the binaries in isolation. Um, but a lot of production BPF code is sort of woven into these larger services and binaries. So we want to provide that same support. You can just write like a BPF trace snippet similar to how BCC kind of works. Um, and just have uh, a library that compiles and runs it similar to a BPF program. And there'd be this like API that it would construct that you could uh, interact with. Uh, we also really want to set up a BPF trace website. Our current website is a little sad, it's new, um, but we really like the eBPF uh, IO website, which includes uh, nice bits about the version of these features that uh, is a minimum, and we want BPF trace to follow the same model and uh, basically explain to you what functions are available uh, depending on which kernels and which BPF trace version. And for those who don't do a lot of kernel development and really focused on their user space programs and observing their user space programs, we want to be able to support much more complex um, types for non-native languages. So we're starting, you know, C++ automatically if it's native, but it has a lot of complex types that like C doesn't understand. So we want to be able to have BPF trace understand these things. So if you know you have an ARG. Uh, for your funk in your C++ program, and it's a string, right, a C++ string, we want to be able to get details and interact with that um, string in, um, in BPF trace, which would be really nice and go a long way to uh, doing a lot better user space debugging. Um, we want to add more map features. So right now we don't even have, like, if the map has a key, uh, we have to sort of rely on if the key is zero. So we're fixing that. Um, there's a bunch of different BPF maps also that aren't available yet in BPF trace, like simple LRU hashes or LRU per CPU hashes, bloom filters, queues. Um, we want to make these maps accessible so that you can really tune your BPF trace program um, to do exactly what you want it to do and, and you know, have good performance as well. Um, we're also talking about you know printing maps synchronously versus asynchronously, which is a whole interesting conversation about how sort of latency works between kernel and user space. Um, yeah. Right now, BPF trace just outputs to the console or to your you know standard out, and. At Meta, we've built a thing to sort of slurp this up and, and convert it to uh, something you can look at in like a SQL, MySQL table visualizer or something like that. We can already look at pie charts or whatever. Um, but we want to make this available to people outside of Meta. So it's a tracing program, right? So it should be able to support or have a function or a library that slurps up BPF trace output and generates cool timelines generates flame graphs if you're looking at user and kernel stacks, and then, yeah, like I said, uh, distribution graphs in, in PyTrust for Instagrams. So this is Perfetto. Uh, right now I'm working on something that, like I said, takes BPF trace output, and you can see like on a timeline where like those page faults would happen in your program, and then on what process and thread, you can also see like the total of them progressing through your BPF trace. So yeah, we really need to be able to like generate a nice looking trace visualization for the address. And as I mentioned before, yeah, flame graphs would be really neat as well. If you haven't seen a flame graph before, these are essentially uh, function call stacks that are aggregated. Uh, so you can see, you know, basically inclusive and exclusive time, and just sort of like where time is being set, spent on the CPU if you're looking at CPU cycles, for example which is a really common sort of uh, hardware event to uh, look at when you're looking at flame graphs for call stacks. 
Um, here's some resources for BPF Trace uh, and just BPF in general. Uh, we are, of course, accepting new contributions to the primary BPF Trace repository. We also recently started this user tools repository. So basically, if you have a new BPF Trace program that you think is useful and you just want to share with the community, uh, add it there. There's really not a lot of, uh, you know, we're not going to be sticklers about, you know, how well it works on every platform. It's basically a community-driven place that we want to just have people sharing uh, neat observability scripts that help them. Uh, we're also on IRC. Um, plenty of chatter happening there all the time. Uh, Brandon Gregg's introduction to BPF Trace is also super helpful. He wrote a very large book a while ago, uh, which has a lot of good BPF Trace examples that are very much still valid today. Um, so yeah, that's and his blog is also extremely helpful. And then yeah, these are the BPF resources, uh, some of which I mentioned. And that's it. Please questions. Answered my questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a very lame question. Uh, how, uh, in what, under what look, I've never used BPF before. Thank you. No. Uh, thank you uh, for you know, making me aware of this. Uh, so I'm trying to think of a use case where I, I'm going to use BPF phrase instead of S phrase. Mm. Um, I would say that BPF trace probably has more expressiveness. Like you can write a lot of your own logic. To be honest, I haven't used BPF trace a ton, so I don't know entirely. Um, are there things that you use BPF trace for now that you that that it doesn't do that you would really like? No, no. Of, of course, this is a much enhanced tool. Offhand, uh, what would uh, person who is starting on debugging stuff like this would go for you know? that, that's, that's I think it really depends on what you're debugging and what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. it sounds like you might be looking at the system calls from this application in this, in this category, but then yeah. you might find that your application is running slow and then you want to find out exactly why it's, what's happening at the kernel level that might, right. that might support that that change like are they contact so, switches are they sure yeah so this tool complements the, the existing easier so called tools yeah i mean i've seen a lot of them people putting together like these tools like they reach for ones they're more familiar with obviously but i've definitely seen them use like in tandem like they'll reach for one and then they'll maybe like want to do something a little specialized and they'll reach for bpf trace because it's more expressive uh, and then if it's, you see something really expressive, then you go write your own like raw the BPF program, and you know you have to do it with like BPF C code. Uh, second silly question is that uh, can we leverage this to debug MPI programs? Um, to leverage what kind of programs? Uh, parallel, parallel programs, MPI. You could do DMA, DMA calls, things like that, direct memory access. Lots of the lots of the other lots of the other things that were surrounding your MPI. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. So when are you gonna when are you gonna have a matrix room for all this stuff? You said you have an IRC channel. Where's the matrix room? I mean, I, I use Matrix to access this channel. Okay, so it's bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's see. So yeah, join. What's a good way to find what trace points are available? Oh, uh, so let me go back to my earlier slides. One of my early examples there, the last one, BPF trace dash L. This basically lists all the different trace points and the attach points that BPF trace can use. Uh, and you can, you know, specify you know, different substrings that only matches all ones or just grab them if you want. And this also, uh, if you use BPF trace dash L V, it can actually show you 
uh, the arguments for some of the trace points, which is really handy.
No, oh, that's... you already pressed. Yeah.